Hello everybody, this is Jenna Strusan from the Breast Health Collaborative of Texas. I hope that everybody is able to hear me. I see Angelica is saying that she cannot hear. Can you hear now? Yes, okay, terrific. So I am excited to introduce Dorothy Gibbons. She's the CEO and co-founder of The Rose. She's an advocate for women, especially those in need, and created a place that was the first of its kind in 1986, a place where every woman could receive quality care regardless of her ability to pay. Today, her first nonprofit, The Rose, provides breast health care to more than half a million women, insured and uninsured, and serves 35 counties throughout Southeast Texas. Her nonprofit experience involves healthcare, education, and women's issues. The Rose's model has been replicated in six states, and Dorothy's work has been recognized by local, state, and national awards. So a few things before um, Dorothy gets started. I just wanted to let y'all know that this presentation is being recorded. And also, if you need a certificate of attendance, at the end of the presentation, I'm going to make available a link where you can download the certificate, but I'm only gonna do that at the end, and it'll be a little box that pops up called Files, and you'll be able to download it straight from there. So everyone that's listening in will be able to get that, and we won't have any issues with getting it to you, but if we do, feel free to send me an email, and I will email it to you. All right, so I would like to give the microphone over to Dorothy. Thank you, Jenna. And it is just such a delight to be here with the Breast Health Collaborative and with everyone who's online. When, uh, just one second. When Dixie and I started the Rose uh, 30 years ago, you know, we wanted to do breast cancer right. And there was a lot of differences between then and now, but nothing has changed in the way we feel about breast cancer or about how women should be treated or the need to be, uh, you know, the voice for the women who don't have a voice. And today when we talk about the USPSTF recommendations, there's nothing right about them. So I know that most of you are in the breast cancer world and most of you know about this, but part of this is refresher and part of this is really how and what and what we can't do about these very dangerous recommendations. Last uh, year on January 11th, the USPSTF finalized their recommendations, which in essence say that women should wait until they're 50 before they start having their annual mammograms, but then they're not even having them annually. They're to have them every other year until they're 74. Now the annual mammograms for 40 year olds were downgraded to a level C, which long way around means that they're not gonna be covered by healthcare plans. In case I go into my alphabet soup too much, here's some of the players, USPSTF, the uh, HRSA, the Affordable Care Act, American Cancer Radiology, Social Society of Breast Imaging, and uh, the American College of Radiology. I'm going to be referring to some of those throughout this. So one of the biggest questions that came out when these recommendations were made was just who is this task force and why are they given the responsibility or the authority to make such a decision? And one of the big challenges that the, the radiology community put out was that, you know, this group is made up of statisticians and other physicians, but there's no breast cancer experts in it. And two of the members aren't even physicians. Now there's great debate on do we need experts or do we not? But we have to remember this is an appointed group by the government and it acts in an advisory role. When those recommendations came out, even before they were finalized, they were all immediately challenged by the ACR and the SBI and other breast cancer experts. Everyone came out and said, we don't agree. Articles were, oh, they were appearing left and right. 
but they were all very medical and all very mm, uh, statistics and all very deep. I'm not sure that any of these were ever really understood by the public. And what we have to remember is no matter what, the Affordable Care Act provides for preventive health care. And that includes mammograms and cervical cancer screening and prenatal. And usually it's without any cost to the woman. Now, after the, the recommendations were finalized, the U.S. government mandates a moratorium. And this was a, a bipartisan bill that came out. And it was called the PALS Act. And it said that they would put a moratorium on the USPSTF recommendations for two years. And the whole idea was that they would vet the recommendations and the process. And that was the most important part by which they were created. In uh, July last year, uh, Senator Blunt came out and said, I want to extend those two years even another two years. That bill passed the uh, committee, but unfortunately it never got out of committee and it may or may not come back up this next year. I'm giving you the according to the law statement and I know that you'll be able to get these slides afterwards. So there you have it. It states it all. I'm not going to read it, but this is what it really says that we have to keep doing for this during this time of the moratorium. But two years or four years, the damage is done. Women are more confused. And no matter how much a physician or a referring physician may say, I really do believe in mammograms, if this becomes the final recommendation, then their HEDA scores are going to be impacted and their reimbursement is going to be reduced. And unfortunately, places like the Rose or any other imaging center will not be able to provide that mammogram because they won't have a referring doctor's order. Of course, the insurance companies are already alerting women to the new recommendations and changing coverage. That's scary to me. Recently, in January, 1st of January, HRSA came out and said they had put together a group that said, we're going to look at these recommendations, and they've come out with their, their own recommendations after looking at many different recommendations and pulling together many different groups. And they said that initial screening should start no earlier than age 40 and no later than age 50. But they also said it could be as frequently as annually. And they didn't feel like there should be an age limit on mammograms. So screening works. We know this. You know, sometimes when I hear or see another headliner about mammograms, I want to say, how long are we going to have to keep fighting this battle? You know, this is not our first rodeo. Back in 2002, the USPFTF put out recommendations that we had to fight. In 2009, it was the same thing, the same type of recommendations that we had to fight. Only then, they weren't finalized. And it took about 2 million signatures and a whole lot of women's voices that made that recommendation turn around. So this time, the difference is they are finalized. It won't matter how many signatures that we get. We're going to have to do something different. We, we showed a lot of this breast cancer truth back in another web, webinar in April. And if you've seen it, then uh, this is a refresher course for you. I know that my audience on this webinar does not need to be reminded of the importance of, of uh, screening mammograms. But this article by Dr. Zubier was one of the very best that I have ever read because she laid it on the line. You know, she gave us a lot of different bullet points about why screening is so important and, and the difference that mammography has made. And you can go down the percentages and you'll see one after another statement about why it is so important. The irony is the task force agrees. They said that, you know, there's adequate evidence that the mammography screening reduces breast cancer mortality in women aged 40 to 74. How more confusing can this thing get? 25% of all breast cancers occur in women in their 40s. At the Rose, we see this year after year. I've compared to many of our other uh, partners in the breast cancer world, they say the same thing. And we're gonna to touch on this a little more, but the most years of life are lost to those women whose cancers occur in their 40s. Size does matter. You know, it's the idea that we have 
incredible treatment now that can take care of breast cancer, and that's true. We have incredible treatment, but size matters. The smaller we get it, the better we've got a chance of getting that cancer being eliminated and responding to drugs and radiation. And you know, there's just such a big difference in the options that a woman has. You know, one of the things that drove me crazy was that the USPSTF kept saying, all these poor little women, they have so much stress, they just can't handle it when they get called back or when, they, when they're worried about what's going on in their breast. You know, women can handle stress. We handle all kind of things. And most of it involves stress. And, and all this talk about the anxiety is, is just something that shouldn't even have come up in this discussion. And if there's anyone to decide how much anxiety she can have, it's that woman, not a task force. I've heard this before and I'm gonna share it with you. Would we be having this conversation if the breast cancer ribbon was this color? You know, we totally ignored, or the USPSD have ignored the fact that the benefit of knowing your mammogram is normal is a very important benefit. And at the very end of a lot of the discussions, most of the people are saying, if we're going to talk about the abnormal benefits or the, or the harms, we must talk about the good benefits. Never in the equation of how these screening recommendations were decided was suffering a part of the equation. And that's important because it's not just about mortality. It's also about the loss of all the things that come with a breast cancer diagnosis. And that needs to be worked into the equation. The idea that we have an average risk and that risk-based screening, it's just invalid. 75% of all the breast cancers that occur in women have no family history. And most of us know the biggest risk we have of breast cancer is being a woman. The math is pretty straightforward, and even though there's been some new studies out that talk about how uh, callbacks and, and diagnosis is made, this is pretty basic. A thousand women result in less than a hundred women coming back, result in 10 biopsies, and almost always results in two cancers, very small cancers, being found. So what happens if these recommendations are followed? Well, there's been lots of folks that have done lots of, of uh, math and put together the equations, but this one was probably the most scariest. If women now in their 30s were to follow these guidelines, an additional 100,000 lives will be lost. And those are lives that could have been saved. What else will happen? More, more families will be disrupted and grieving. More women will suffer from the effects of more aggressive treatment. But I think the scariest percentage or statistic that came up was that 30% of the women who undergo chemotherapy never return to the workforce. That's a, that's a fact now. What will it happen when they're having to have more aggressive chemotherapy? It is estimated that the cost of providing end of care life to the additional 16,000 women who will die of breast cancer as a result of curtailed screening, and this is annually, would be about $4 billion. $4 billion is the same amount of money healthcare plans pay on drugs like Viagra. Now, no one ever, ever died from ED. So our question is, will 40 year olds be the new uninsured? Because we are already seeing it, insured companies and healthcare plans are going to withdraw coverage and this test will not be accessible. And why should women start in their 40s? You know, breast cancer is a big deal for women in their 40s. We've already shown you that 25% of all the cancers are in, for women in their 40s, but the big other condition is that one third of all years of life lost to breast cancer are from women in their 40s. And this schematic just took it through all the way through about the impact of what it's diagnosed early. Whoops, I'm sorry. So the other thing is that about the annually screening every other year, screening every year. Well, this one shows that when we screen annually, the most lives are saved. 
it's very, very clear to us that mammograms work. But I think the other issue in these recommendations that are often overlooked is that every other year from age 50 to 74, I'm here to tell you just in our small organization in the last two years, these women would not be around and probably would have found their cancers very late if it had not been for them having their annual mammograms. Our recommendations are that you start your annual mammograms beginning at 40, that you know your family history, your body, you speak up if you see a change, and you don't delay. We often tell women that we can't be afraid of finding breast cancer, but we sure ought to be afraid of finding it late. So what you can do, what we can do, well, we can educate, we can keep up with what's coming out with the, the different articles and the different steps in Congress, which that is going to be our primary hope right now. And that's why being an advocate for this is going to be so important. Now, the biggest thing that we are doing right now or are hoping that we are getting through is that women need to challenge if their insurance company is not paying for their mammogram right now still covered by the majority of them. But if they start getting pushback from, oh, that's not the current recommendations, they need to challenge that. And if anyone wants to talk to me more about that, I'll be glad to talk to you. You know, our, our biggest message is that if, if you're, it's time for your mammogram, you need to schedule it while your insurance still covers it. We must have a dozen articles on our website and you will find them under news slash media news stories. And all of the things that I've been talking about are in detail on our website. But I have to tell you, just three or four days ago, this uh, debate uh, video and, of course, the associated article came out on um, WebMD. And it is excellent. It covers everything about screening mammograms, about the, the premise that there's overdiagnosis and that there's overtreatment. It's really excellent. It came out on January 20th, and we'll be posting it soon, too. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about who we are willing to lose. And these are some of the lovely, wonderful women in our life that were diagnosed in their 40s. And some of them are not with us any longer. You know, the thing I always say is in this picture, can you tell the insured woman from the uninsured? Nah, breast cancer doesn't make any difference. And for all these women that we have served and that will need our service in the future, I'm here to tell you we need to make a stand and we need to object to screening mammograms being eliminated from our lives. Our future and our health, our ultimate health, depends on it. So questions? If you have any questions, feel free to put it in the chat box. If you're on the phone, I will try unmuting everybody. It might get a little loud, so if so. Actually, if you have a question and you're on the phone, if you press star star, it'll unmute you. So you can do that or you can chat a question. That was a lot of information, and Dorothy did a really great job of explaining everything. Do we have any questions? A few people are typing. Oh, good. I know I went through it pretty fast, but like I said, every single one, this is going to be shown or saved, isn't it, Jenna? Yes. So that we can access it again. And also, um, if y'all would like the presentation, I can, sure. I can and send it to you if you want to ask me for the presentation. I'm happy to send it. Mm -hmm. Yes, the presentation will be provided. So, you know, while we're waiting for the others who are typing, I really wanted to encourage you to know your congressman. 
that's going to be how we can stop this and ensure that these recommendations and the process that recommendations are made on any screening procedure is really reviewed. Hopefully we could get this, uh, uh, you know, the ultimate moratorium put on these recommendations and that it will be reversed or will be reviewed again. And, and we'll, we'll look at things like the current technology and we'll look at, you know, most of these recommendations came from analog film studies. We'll look at digital films. It will be incredibly important to us as women that we make our voices heard in Congress. And you know, I never was much of a political animal and I'm still not, but I do know it takes, it takes us talking to our individual senators and our congressmen to say, hey, we need your help. We need you to pass this in another two years of moratorium. And that's, that's our greatest hope. So we had a few questions. Um, we have Jennifer said she hopped on late. Is the USTF trying to keep this from being a screening exam at all? Well, what they're saying is that with the down. Grading it to a C level is that it is not recommended. It may be a value, but it's not really recommended for 40 euros or on an annual basis. Now, what that does is those recommendations dictate how insurance companies pay for for procedures. It's that simple. You know, there's a lot of talk about the USPFTS is, you know, primarily they're looking at stats. Nobody's ever going to argue that more women in their 50s die of breast cancer and get breast cancer than women in their 40s. But the whole deal is we don't stop screening just because there's more women in the 50s than there are in the 40s. And it all comes down to that. There was, I, before we go on to the next question, I wanted to tell everyone that um, if you look at your screen on the top left, there's a box that says files, and that's where you can download your certificate of attendance. And I've also put the webinar, the slides there also. So the second thing on the list are the slides. So if you click on them and press download, then you have them right there. Okay, so yeah. I'm seeing Karen's question. Can everyone see the questions, mm -hmm. Jenna? Okay. So, um, you know, like I said, 75% of all the women who are diagnosed with breast cancer do not have a family history. 
that average risk stuff is, is something that we may also have to challenge because we're all at risk if we are a woman. And um, the, the risk to, to women that don't have a family history by not having your screening done in their 40s and on an annual basis is that we're not going to catch it early. We're not going to detect it early. And it's back again to the earlier we detect this, the better chance and the better options that woman's going to have. There was another question um, up above that asked if any organizations were working to change this policy. There are a lot. And primarily it's the organizations who have the ability to have lobbyists in Congress. Um, ACR, American Cancer, I mean, the American College of Radiology has fought, fought, fought tooth and nail with this. And, you know, their, their best um, efforts have been surrounding education. But they're also doing great work in saying this is going to be the ultimate cost, and we're talking dollars and cents cost, to society if we don't, if we stop screening 40-year-olds. So the Society of Breast Imaging is also working very hard to try to get this turned around. Um, and uh, many of the, the big breast cancer players are, are lobbying. You know, that's, that's what, when HRSA came out in January, I was so excited because they had brought together some of the biggies. And they came out and said, look, we believe that women should be having their screening mammograms starting in 40 and having them annually. And, you know, HRSA, as I understand it, has just about, if not more, the same authority, which neither one of them really have a lot of authority as an advisory group, but they have the same impact on government and on uh, insurance coverage and on those kind of decisions as the USPFTF. So we, we have to keep reminding our, our Congress of that and also reminding each other that as long as we have the Affordable Care Act, we're not going to debate that, but as long as we have that, we have coverage. It is the law. So I've also uploaded the webinar as a PDF for those of you who can't open